We're going to look at the passage that was just read earlier by Keegan. We're looking at the life of Abraham as we walk through the Old Testament book of Genesis. And one of the things that often bless our heart is the uh, practicality of God's Word. When you look at a passage like last week we looked at it as a 90-year-old woman and a 100-year-old man are having a baby, you wonder to yourself, how, how practical is that for me and, and for anyone else? But it certainly was miraculous if it wasn't practical. And there's something to be said about the miraculous. In chapter 2 of the book of Acts, the early church were told that fear came upon them. And many signs and wonders were being performed by the apostles. I mean, which one of us wouldn't like to see a sign and a wonder from God that just causes you to stand in awe of his hand at work in our lives or the lives of someone else? I would love to have seen Will jump from the hospice bed the other day. I would have certainly had some fear. I would have definitely been in awe. I would have loved to have seen that. But I didn't. I would love to see one of our senior adults in this room have a baby next year. I doubt if I'll get any volunteers. You yeah, we'll volunteer others. Yeah, that's that's a, <laughs> that's what, yeah, you'll, we'll volunteer others for that. I don't think we're going to see that. But I do want to share this with you. It's something that uh, is personal as well as I, I think is practical. The miraculous is often sought when the practical is overlooked, Amen. minimized, or neglected. Let me say that again. The miraculous is often sought when the practical is overlooked, minimized, or neglected. Now there's nothing externally wrong with the miracles. They cause us to stand in awe of the great power of God and how he defies even his laws of nature to accomplish his purpose and his will. Nothing wrong with that. The problem is not the external, it's the internal. What's in here? What motivates a desire for God to do the miraculous? I can tell you personally, it's about vindication. Lord, show that, I'm a real, that I really belong to you. Do something that demonstrates that you are alive and well in my life and that you vindicate me as one of your children. And unfortunately, my motivation is not always pure I'm not sure about you show them Lord that you're on my side do something and then God got my attention in the past and even today you do something to show them I'm in you Well, that's not fair. Don't throw it back on me, God. You do something to show them that I am in you. Not that he needs it, but God can say this to me. You vindicate me. Vindicate that I'm your Lord. Well, that's not what I came here for, Lord. What is it practically... What is it that God would like us to see? What's the practicality of what we do as God's people? For me, Wednesday night is a practical time for us. We gather together to pray. Even more practical, we walk out of this building and we go into the neighborhoods and we pray for the people who live in those homes and asking God to do his work. I might say something to God like this, 
show me. See, Lord, I would like to see as we're out there praying, 3,000 souls get saved. I don't know where we'd pack them all, but we'd, we'd figure it out, wouldn't we? I would like to see 3,000 souls saved, 5,000 men saved. I would love to see that. Yeah, I would love to see one of you ladies pregnant at age 90. That would be cool. I would have loved to see Will climb off that hospice bed and be here this morning to worship with us. I'd also like to see a new sanctuary building like Jerusalem fell from heaven. I would like to see it fall back here behind this building where our property is extended. I'd like to see that too. But God shown me this. Here's what I would like you to see, Ed. Here's what I would like you to see. As I studied this passage, that's basically what he said to me. Here's what I want you to see. Not to hear any audible voice, it just as I was studying this passage and praying, that's what came across my mind and I I'm confident it was from the Lord. Here's what I want you to see. Number one in your outline. And I hope you see it too. The overpowering judgment. The overpowering judgment. This is what this passage is speaking about. God's going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. You'll see later on, it's devastated. The cities are devastated. They're left in ruin. Nothing there. Everyone dead. God judges the city. Number one, the coming judgment of God on sinners. Can I, can I offer you a phrase that I often hear in Christendom that perhaps we need to rethink? God loves the sinner but hates the sin. He does love the sinner, yes. And he does hate sin, but you need to realize he doesn't separate the two. When God's judgment comes, it's not coming on sin, it's coming on the sinner. And that's a, a sobering reality, I hope, for each one of us, personally and compassionately, as we look at the world around us. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, beginning with verse 4. Listen, a tumult on the mountains like that of mighty people. Listen, an uproar among the kingdoms like nations being gathered together. The Lord of hosts is mobilizing an army for war. They are coming from a far land, from a distant horizon. The Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, everyone's hands will become weak and every man's heart will melt. They will be horrified. Pain and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look at each other, their faces flushed with fear. Look, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel and rage and burning anger, to make the earth desolate and destroy the sinner on it. In Revelation chapter 14, you cannot get a more descriptive passage concerning the destruction of God upon sinners. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter. Chapter 2, begin with verse 4. I know it's in here somewhere. For if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but threw them down into Tartus, and delivered them to be kept in chains and darkness until judgment. And if he didn't spare the ancient world and protect Noah, a preacher of righteousness and seven others, when he brought a flood on the world of the ungodly, and if he reduced the city of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to ruin, making them an example to those who are going to be ungodly. 
And if you rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the unrestrained behavior of the immoral, for as he lived among them, that righteous man tormented himself day by day with the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who follow the polluting desires of the flesh and despise authority. I can't think of a time in history where America has despised authority more than today or has been more immoral than it has been today. What can we expect from God if we continue to live this way? Certainly we will expect the judgment of God on sinners. So what does God want us to do? Number two, teach those under our care. Genesis 18, 19, the passage we've been looking at. God tells us and Abraham, for I have chosen him so that he will command, listen, command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Our responsibility is to teach others what God expects from them. He expects them to turn from their sin in repentance. By faith, trust Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation and to allow the Holy Spirit as he comes into their lives to li guide their lives in the direction and the path God would have them to walk. That's what we need to teach them. We need to teach them that there is a coming judgment. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 17. After Lot had separated from him, we go back a little bit so you can get the context why we do what we do. After Lot separated from him, the Lord said to Abraham, Look from the place where you are. Look north, south, east, and west. For I will give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up, listen, get up. This is where it came from, what we do on Wednesday night. Get up and walk from one end of the land to the other, for I will give it to you. I believe with all my heart, there is no doubt in any part of my being that God has placed our church here in this place for a purpose. As far as we can see, we are responsible for every living being that lives within walking distance from this building. We are responsible for them. If we don't teach them about the fact that there's going to be a judgment, a final judgment on sinners, who is going to teach them? I'll tell you right now, they're, going to, they're not going to want to listen to us. Amen? The last thing Sodom and Gomorrah was ready for is to hear someone to tell them the coming judgment is, the judgment is coming upon them from God. They wouldn't have responded. You and I can run out to these streets and get into these homes and tell people about the coming judgment of God. It won't change them one iota. What's going to change people is when the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they see themselves as ones who need to be judged by God. They see themselves as sinners. Our job is to realize they're under our care and let God lead us how we're to teach them to command all that he would have them to obey. You see, the eternal greatness of God is what people need to know. The eternal greatness of God's holiness. His holiness. Kadash is the Hebrew word which means separated. Do you know that when God's attributes, we understand him as a God who loves. Amen? A God who's merciful. A God who's forgiving. But you need to realize that everything stems from his holiness. When Isaiah there in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, saw the Lord, the, the, he heard the, 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 the cherubim crying out, Holy, holy, holy. There around the throne in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, the elders fall down, the, the creatures fall down, and they cry out, Holy, holy, holy. Do you know that God in his 
magnificent and his greatness is referred to as holy, holy, holy. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that God is love, love, love. Nowhere does it say that God is merciful, merciful, merciful. Nowhere is that emphasis placed on any other attributes of God other than his holiness. Many times the attributes of God's holiness is referred to as holy, holy, holy. We sing holy, holy, holy. Today we sung again holy, holy, holy. Folks, we have got to put the emphasis on the fact that God is holy. He is separated. There is no God like him, the Bible tells us. He is so holy and perfect and righteous, you and I have no privilege to come into his presence. It is impossible because we are so distinctly different. He is the great God and creator who is holy, perfect, righteous, unlike anything else. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, it said, Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you? Your glory, your glorious holiness. First Samuel chapter two, verse two. It was Hannah who cried out, no one is like you. No one is holy like you. There is no rock like our God. Folks, first and foremost, we know God loves us. He's offered us forgiveness, so we don't have to faith face the wrath of his judgment. But do we need to realize he is holy, holy, holy. The eternal wages of our sin demonstrate how separated we are from him. His, holy, his greatness is in his holiness and our separation is the result of our sin. The eternal wages of our sin that reminds us that we are all sinners, the Bible tells us. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus warns us in verse 8, if your hand or your, or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better to go into, the, into eternity, into heaven, lame than it is to be cast into hell with all your limbs. In chapter 25 verse 46, it reminds us that the wrath of God in hell is, is an eternal punishment. It's going to endure forever in Jude chapter 7. Jude chapter, se or chapter 7, verse 7. That's a chapter, yeah, there are how many chapters are in Jude? Uh, 20, 25. <laughs> Let's go to verse 7. In the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them committed sexual immorality and practiced perversion just as they did and serve, that serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. We have got to get that drained in our head. It's got to be ingrained in our minds. It's got to, it's got to, it's got to be so clear to us. You know, we, we were talking in our class today about taking these little tests about discovering your spiritual gift and your ministry and, and, and all these sort of things. And, and people obviously don't like taking tests. And I said, all right, don't take a test. But you better be ready for the final. A final will come. We will all stand before God and give an account of our lives. I have no doubt when Will left this earth Saturday morning, he stood before God Almighty and gave an account of his life. Praise be to God. His account was, was clear because of the blood of Jesus. So that's our third thing, the final accountability before God. People. I don't believe that I'm going to stand before God someday and be judged. It doesn't matter what you believe. This is what God says. Every one of us are going to stand before God and give an account of our lives. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 tells us that he's going to judge the living and the dead. First Peter chapter 4 verse 5. And they said that we will give an account to the one who will judge the living and the dead. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. He said God will judge the immoral and the adulterer, Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, again, reminds us that the fact that God is going to judge the living and the dead. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it's for each man to die once. Yes, you are going to die. And then comes judgment. And God will try each one of our lives if they are not found by faith on Christ alone, by faith, 
through the blood of Jesus by faith alone and what he did on the cross for the salvation of our sin. Folks, it's an eternal separation from a holy God forever. Do you realize that every person in this community that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is our responsibility and they are going to hell without Christ. They're going to face the judgment of God. It's not just the judgment, it's also the wrath of God. And that's what he told Abraham to do. Abraham, those who are your children, who come after you, who you're responsible for, you teach them. They're not going to listen to us. Well, Pastor, you're just rambling on about teaching them. If they're not going to listen to us, what are we going to do? Well, let's keep going. Number three, number two. There's an overwhelming need for justice. An overwhelming need for justice. Why? Well, I just told you why. Number one, God's holiness demands justice. God's holiness ju demands justice. Verse 19. For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. It has to be just. If we're going to do what God wants us to do, we need to be just, reflecting his holiness. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 23. I will honor the holiness of of my great name, he said, which has been profaned among the nations. You have profaned it among them. Who did? We, who are his people. We profane the holiness of God by not living the justice and doing what God has called us to do by teaching others to obey all that he did us. Isaiah chapter five, verse 16, the Lord of hosts is exalted by his justice. And the holy God is distinguished by righteousness. God demands justice. Number two, God hears the cry of injustice. Do you know that? Verse 20. Then the Lord s said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is immense, and their sin is extremely serious. I will go down there and see what they have done justifies the cry that has come up to me. God knows what's going on. We're offered this passage right here to remind us that God is aware of the cries of injustice. When you and I are walking in the streets on Wednesday night, we're praying, do you have any idea what's going on behind those doors? I mean, the neighborhood I walk is very quiet. Very few people I see coming out in the street. But do you know that God knows every single thing that's happening behind those doors? He knows those who are being abused. He knows the neglect, the loneliness, the hatred, the immorality, the adulteress, the addiction to pornography, drugs, alcohol, gambling. He knows all those things that are happening behind those doors. He wants us to see that. He wants us to see the struggle people are going through so that we will do something to make a difference. Number three. And because of all this is happening in our world around us, God is going to judge the sinner for what they're doing. But praise be to God, number three. God satisfied his justice in Christ. Come on, hang on to this. This ought to get you excited. The wrath of God that came upon this earth during the day of Noah where he sent a flood to destroy all of the earth. When Sodom and Gomorrah, the injustice, cried out to him, he sent down the hail balls on it and the fire and destroyed those cities completely. Over and over again, you read. You read it, don't you? When you read the Old Testament, you read over and over again how God dealt with sinners. He brought his judgment. In the New Testament, you wonder, wow, do we have a new God now? You read that, right? This, the God of the Old Testament seems to have disappeared. He seems much more gracious and loving. No, he's still the same God. But instead of pouring his wrath out on sinners, he took his whole wrath and he poured it out on his son. That's what you see in the New Testament. God doesn't bring down his judgment, his wrath, upon you and me today. 
because he poured it out on his son. And all we do is wait till his final wrath. And the day of reckoning comes where we stand before God Almighty. And only two opportunities are before us today to accept what Jesus did for us by taking the wrath of God upon himself. Or you and I can take the wrath of God upon ourselves. That's our choice. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, he says, We are righteous by his blood, saved through him from the wrath. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he tells us that he who no, knew no sin, what did he do? He became sin for us. He became our sin and took the wrath of God upon himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says, But from him you are in Christ, who for us became wisdom from God, as well as righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that as it is written, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. You see, the Lord did it all for us. I know people today who just think because they do good things and wonderful things that they're going to one day walk before the presence of God, stand there, and they're going to tell God, look at all the good things I did. And we already know what the Bible says about that. They'll claim that they cast out demons in his name. They did miracles in his name. And Jesus said, be gone. I never knew you. It has to be trusting Christ alone by faith alone. And the living presence of God comes and lives within you as you turn from your sin and trust Jesus. He is the down payment of what is waiting for us in glory. We will not have to face the wrath of God. But we will face an eternity with him in heaven. I want to move on to number three. We looked at the overpowering judgment, the overwhelming need for justice that comes from God's holiness and he will bring his justice. But the overlooked work of the justified. You see, those of us who are in Christ, the Bible calls us justified. It's a court term that we stand before the judge who is God and he determines and deems us as being justified as if everything has been forgiven. And it has because we've trusted what Christ has done for us. Of all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. And we stand justified before God. That's you and me. I think Abraham knew of God's mercy. No doubt in my mind he knew about God's mercy. In chapter 18, verses 22 and 23, it says, The men turned from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham remained standing for the Lord. It tells us in verse 23, Abraham stepped forward and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous from the wicked? I know about your mercy. There's no way you're going to destroy the wicked if the righteous are there. And, and you and I know about God's mercy. Don't you know about God's mercy? He does not give us what we deserve. He's offered us forgiveness. He's offered us just as if we didn't do it. That's merciful, folks. And Abraham knew it. You and I know it. Those of us who stand justified before God because of Christ. Number two, Sodom and Gomorrah experienced God's mercy. When they went into captivity after the, remember back in chapter 14, when, when, when the kings from the east came and, and took them captive and, and, and took them up north, Abraham went after them and went and destroyed their whole armies and rescued Lot and all of Sodom and Gomorrah and brought them all back safely. Why? Did they deserve it? No. By the mercy of God, he gave Abraham this privilege to rescue Sodom and Gomorrah. And then they had the privilege to, to be before Mount, uh, Melchizedek, the great high priest, and watch Abraham offer up a, an offering to him. They had a wonderful experience of knowing the mercy of God. But it didn't matter, even though they knew it, they continued to live in their mor immorality and their disgrace before a holy and righteous God. So what does Abraham do? The justified stood in the gap for Sodom and Gomorrah. He stood in the gap. 
He knew it was coming upon them. He knew the wrath of God was going to be their fate. And he stood in the gap and he began to cry out and intercede for them. And he prayed and he prayed. Ver chapter 18 again, verse 23. As he stepped before the Lord in verse 24, if there are 50 righteous people in the city, will you really sweep away? Sweep it away instead of sparing the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people who are in it? Are you really gonna do that? And he continued to pray and, and, and all of a sudden he realized, wait a minute, God's talking to me. He said, how about 45 if there's 45? How about there's 40, 30, 20? If there's just 10. You know, the sad thing is when we go out and pray, there's just about 10 of us. But do you realize the type of prayer he prayed as he stood in the gap? It was a compassionate, compassionate prayer. We, before you ever go out and pray, you gotta care the, about these people first. You have to care about them. If you don't have a love for people in your heart, folks, I don't care what church you go to. I don't care where you serve. I don't care if you know the deep things about the mystery of God and able to share them with them. If you don't have love for people, the Bible says you're just a noisy gong if you don't have love. It all comes from the fact that we have compassionate and love for people. There's no doubt in my mind, Abraham had love for these people. And they didn't even know one iota about Abraham probably. The second thing, it was a God-focused prayer. Abraham didn't ask to be justified, did he? He said, Lord, you justify yourself in this. Why? Because he knew the God of justice would do what? is right God will always do what's right God you just show that you are right when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah do you know every person every sinner that was destroyed deserved to be destroyed and everyone that was delivered by the grace and mercy of God they responded to God and were delivered and you'll see that later on as we go on in the story it was a God focused prayer it was a humble prayer look at verse 27 since I have ventured to speak to the Lord, even though I am dust and ashes, who gives us the right to come before God and ask Him anything? He humbled himself knowing that this was made possible only because of the graciousness and the love and the mercy of God. He came before God and he prayed. It was a persistent prayer. You see that persistence? All right, God, 50. He said, you know, even 50 I won't destroy. How about 45? And he kept going 40, 30. You know, if there's just one. But he never got there, did he? He got the ten. God said, even if there's ten, what does God do? He walks away from them. But he was persistent. Yes, we're going to continue to march in these streets Wednesday night after Wednesday night. Yes, it's going to be hot here in a few more weeks, if it's not hot already. And we're going to have to have some water as we go out and get prepared. Just, we're going to do it. I am steadfast and immovable about this. God has been too clear for me. I'm going, and I want to encourage my church family to join me as we go out and pray for these neighbors. God will do his work to draw them to himself and use us in any way possible. And it's a rewarding prayer. I can see the rewards here. You may have to look a little harder, but then he said, let me, let the Lord not be angry and I will speak one more time. Suppose there are 10 found here. Just 10. I am so thankful that God is going to spare these neighbors from his wrath right now because at least 10 of us are going out and are praying. At least 10 of us are going. That's good enough for me. That's a start. I just want to encourage the rest of you to join us in what we're doing. Because he won't destroy it as long as we're still in there praying. I'll guarantee you that. I'll hold, we can hold God to his word. Not that we have that right to, but God is not a liar, but man is. Jeremiah, 20, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Roam the streets of Jerusalem, or Queen Creek. 
Look and take note. Search in her squares or the roundabouts. If you find a single person, anyone who acts justly, who seeks to be faithful, then I'll forgive her. I'll forgive the city. That's what he's saying. I'll forgive her. I'm going to continue to pray. Lord, draw them to yourself. Lord, may they come out and seek you. And I will do my best to help them find you. When Philip was approached by the Holy Spirit when the Ethiopian eunuch was reading about Jesus in the book of Isaiah, what did he do? He went up to the, the wagon, as he was told, the chariot, and he asked him, so what are you reading? He says, I, I'm reading Isaiah, but I have no idea who he's talking about. And he explained him, this is Jesus Isaiah is talking about. And what did the Ethiopian eunuch say? Well, I've got to get home now. Are you kidding me? He responded to the fact that God was working in his life. And he said, what keeps me from being baptized? And he didn't hesitate. And he committed himself to the Lord. What about you? I'm asking you to consider this. As I just shared this morning, each one of us will. will face the judgment of God. If we're not found in Christ, then we will experience the wrath of God. It is clear God's holiness demands it. Wrath upon the sinner because of their sins. But God offers us, through his love and his mercy, forgiveness through Jesus Christ, who took upon himself the wrath of God. And by faith alone, in Christ alone, we are saved from the wrath to come. And we're privileged to take this good news and share it with those around us. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to come out of the comforts of what you do on Wednesday nights and to join us to pray? So there'll be more than 10, maybe 20, or 30, or 40, or 50 of us in there praying in this community, praying for the Lord. I don't know if we have any other option but to be obedient. What is God saying to you? Not preacher, what's God saying to your heart right now? You commit yourself to Him. Let's stand and we're going to sing.